Good afternoon and welcome to yet another very, very topical and very timely webinar. Um, we were awoken on Sunday morning to a very interesting story in the New York Times about a leaked audio tape um, where they had um, Iranian Prime Minister uh, Mohammad Javad Zarif um, talking and among the things that he said was that um, former Secretary of State John Kerry, now um, the special envoy for climate change, John Kerry, had told him about um, 200 incidences of um, where um, Israel had attacked the IRGC and he said he was astonished. I don't know if he was astonished that um, the United States, an ally of Israel, um, had leaked that information to a sworn enemy of not only the United States, but Israel, or he was astonished that as um, the Iranian foreign minister, he hadn't known, but he, he, um, his remarks reflected astonishment. Um, we are really concerned right now um, about um, Israel facing um, an existential threat from Iran. Um, and that the Iranian, the, I'm sorry, the, the American sin qua non or their prime objective um, in foreign policy is negotiations rather than um, looking at the quality of the threat that is not only to Israel, but is to um, our Gulf allies and um, based on the research that we've done in Emet is also um, a huge threat to the United States because of Hezbollah cells and Venezuela. Um, so we are delighted um, to be able to present to you once again, a wonderful friend of Emet and a, a phenomenal scholar, Professor Ephraim Inbar. Professor Imbar is president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Um, he was also the founding director of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic S Studies, the BESA Center. And he is, um, was professor of political science at Abar Ilan University for many, many years. Um, and he has written many books um, and over a hundred scholarly articles. And um, Ephraim earned his BA in political science and English literature at Hebrew University and his MA and PhD in political science at the University of Chicago. Um, he's been a visiting professor at Johns Hopkins, Georgetown University, the Woodrow Wilson um, International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Um, he's also um, been appointed as the Manford Warner NATO Fellow and was the recipient of um, an Onassis Fellowship. Um, all right, so he has also been a member of the Political Strategic Committee of the National Planning Council and the chair of the Committee of the National Security curriculum at the Ministry of Education, both in Israel. He has served on the Academic Committee of the History Department of the Israel Defense Forces and as president of the Israel Association of International Studies. Um, Ephraim is widely quoted in the international media. Um, so Ephraim, um, if Israel does what it must do or feels it must do, in order to survive an existential threat from the Iranian nuclear bomb, is it inevitable that we will be heading towards a collision course with um, the Biden administration and with um, two very, very long allies? Should, should I start answering? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, you know, in short, the answer is not uh, inevitably, you know, in history, nothing is uh, inevitable, or most of the things are not inevitable. And I'm actually quite hes hesitant to talk about uh, this subject uh, because it is a very sensitive issue. And uh, the mere public discussion of such a scenario 
uh, weakens Israel. After all, one of our uh, uh, strengths is uh, to have a big brother like the United States. And uh, if, uh, you know, we can always rely on its help and uh, just uh, raising the subject uh, obviously um, weakens our deterrence. Uh, but, uh, and of course the US-Israeli relationship is very important to Israel. Uh, and I don't want to elaborate on that, everybody in this audience particularly understands it. But we have to be realistic about its limits. And, uh, you know, uh, Kerry was mentioned, uh, you know, not the smartest person on earth. Uh, that's how the Arabs treated him, by the way, uh, as being a, a tall, not very smart guy. This is how they called him in Arabic. And uh, uh, we know that, uh, particularly in this administration, there are uh, uh, several nominations in critical places that uh, are not real friends of Israel, even if they say they are. You know, it's easy to say. Uh, so I would like first to analyze really what what is the strategic um, background for the U.S the Middle East has become less important. And uh, I don't argue with this assessment. Uh, it's less dependent on energy, as we know. Since 2011, uh, the United States decided uh, to pivot towards the East to face China, which is a real challenger to the United States. The US uh, is tired of two unsuccessful wars, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, in, in our region, and uh, one out. And uh, this choice makes some strategic sense. Uh, what uh, the United States can do and achieve in our region is limited. Obviously, the export of democracy didn't work. Other things also don't work very well. Uh, so uh, this is a strategic reality in which we have to operate. Uh, what does this mean for Israel in strategic terms? First of all, we should expect less US involvement. They don't want to get involved. And we have to respect it and understand it. Uh, at the same time, with less US presence in the region, Israel has more freedom of action. Uh, we don't have to take into consideration what will happen to, to American Middle East policy because American Middle East policy is let leave the Middle East to the Middle East. Israel actually, in strategic terms, has become more important because it's the only true ally in the Middle East that can do things for the United States. Uh, of course, the Saudis are weak. Uh, I think uh, in this audience, I already mentioned, they cannot even uh, do a, an assassination properly. Uh, so uh, they fail in the war in, in Yemen. It's a weak country. Turkey, which is a strong country, is no longer an American ally. And by now, everybody understands it, despite the fact that it is in NATO but it's not a real ally that can do things for the United States or is willing to do things for the United States. We've seen it already in 2003 when they were unwilling to open a, a, a Northern Front in Iraq. And this became more and more pronounced uh, throughout the years. Um, there are no other countries, no Egypt or you know, United Arab Emirates, you know, who, who really has the power, military power, diplomatic power and uh, the political willingness to do things for the United States. So uh, basically we expect that if the US has a problem in the Middle East and doesn't want to get involved, let's its allies do the job. This is what means, you know, a strategic alliance with, with Israel. And uh, they should expect that an ally would do things that are in accordance with the American preferred strategy. And the American pre 
prefer strategy, and they admit it. Iran is a trouble. Iran is a problem in terms of nuclear proliferation. Iran is a problem in terms of, uh, you know, uh, radical Islam. It's uh, threatening American allies. And uh, of course, it wants hegemony over the Middle East. I think this administration, even this administration, can agree with this assessment. Iran is bad news for America. The problem is that the Biden administration, unfortunately, does not always think strategically. And they have other ideas. Uh, and Iran, of course, is the most important issue of dispute between us and the, this administration. And this administration, instead of acting strategically and allowing Israel to do the job the Americans don't want to do, and we are ready to do it, they go and sign an agreement with, the United, with Iran, which is a bad agreement. Even this administration understands that this is a bad agreement and actually the long-term agreement is a stronger and longer agreement. And I am quoting the Biden administration. They understand and still they run for an agreement, uh, which instead of allowing the anti-Iran alliance in the Middle East to do the job, which is to try to demolish the nuclear project and to contain uh, the Iranian you know, proxies that are trying to attempt hegemony in the Middle East. So, you know, the American behavior, I must say, doesn't make sense in strategic terms. And what are they doing? Which does some strategic sense. They kick the can down the road. Basically, the Biden administration wants to remove the Iran issue from their agenda with an agreement in order to be able to focus on other issues which are more important to them. And I understand that China is more important than Iran. Corona at home is more important than Iran. The economy, American economy, is obviously more important than Iran. But this taking, dealing with those issues doesn't make the Iranian challenge disappear. They simply uh, want to remove this issue from their agenda. But for Israel, is, Iran is a threat, it's an existential threat. Of course, the Americans do not all agree on, on this term, but they understand that it's a threat for us. And uh, Israel is determined to continue to obstruct the Iranian nuclear program. So the problem is that we may soon go see the America return to the JCPOA 2015 version. And what will happen after that? If we continue with covert operations, uh, this is probably something that the Americans can digest somehow. I'm not sure, but this is easier to digest. Uh, but uh, it may happen and uh, uh, I'm not sure I know, but it's very possible that at some point, covert operations are not enough to stop the Iranian nuclear project. And then we may have to recur to military strike. And uh, it's quite clear to me that the, Amer the American administration is going to promise the Iranians that they will make sure that no strike will happen. They promised already in 2015. So uh, how will this 
uh, affect American-Israeli relations. Now the Americans, and we had a high level delegation in Washington today, uh, discussing those issues for the Americans at the highest level possible. Uh, and the Americans uh, said that Israel has a right to defend itself. Thank you very much. Uh, words are easy, but what will happen after we strike the Iranian nuclear uh, installations or the critical nuclear installations? We should not forget that despite the warm relations between Israel and his big brother, America, we had a reassessment in 75. We had arms embargo, American arms embargoes on Israel in 81, 82. We had uh, uh, arm twisting on part of the Obama administration. So it's quite clear that uh, the Americans uh, can be nasty because they don't like what the Israelis are doing. Uh, they can be delays in arms transfers, in strategic meetings, in strategic cooperation, which is very good at, now, at this time. By the way, there are other clear uh, strategic decisions made by the Biden administration in this area in particular, that make no strategic sense. For example, uh, removing help or aid to the Saudis against the Houthi uh, attempt to take over Yemen. The Houthis are a proxy of Iran. The Houthis <laughs> have shot at American ships in the Red Sea. Why uh, shouldn't they bother if one of their allies tries to limit the influence of an anti-American agent in the region? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to remove the Houthis from uh, the list of terror, terrorist organizations. They are. They are part of the bad guys. That's not clear. You can continue to negotiate with the Iranians, but why should you make it easier for them? And it's not just you know, a gesture toward uh, Iran. Yemen sits on a very important strategic choke point, Bab el -Mandeh. There they can stop all shipping via Suez Canal, making life difficult for the American Navy, but of course, shipping of other countries. This is the place they, you can influence the Horn of Africa. Anybody that took, takes a look at the map understands the importance of Aden. This is why the British were there for so long time, because it was a strategic place. So I give it to the Iranians. It doesn't make strategic sense. And there are also other issues that burden or will burden the Jerusalem-Washington relationship. Different to, due to different outlook on, on international relations, not necessarily because they don't like Israel or hate Israel. First of all, you know, what we see with this administration is, uh, a religious belief, and I'm a religious guy, I have nothing against religion, but uh, you know, uh, less skepticism uh, about the uh, importance of diplomacy and reluctance to use force. The uh, progressives in the Demo Democratic Party have a particular view of international relations where use of force is anachronistic. I think they are wrong. I think uh, use of force is part of parcel of the rules of the game, particularly in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world. How is going America to contain uh, China 
intrusion in the South China Sea only by military presence. And uh, indeed, I, I long for the Democrats, you know, Mondale, I believe, passed away this week. You know, where are the Mondales? Where are the Jacksons? This was, uh, you know, a different democratic party. And they are influencing uh, this administration, assuming, and I'm not sure if it's a correct assumption, that the president is in control. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about what's happening in the White House. Uh, but if this type of influence grows in the corridors of the White House, uh, America is in trouble. Of course, we'll be in trouble as well, but America will be in trouble because uh, uh, the world is not vegetarian. If you don't use force, uh, you lose. Also, we see, uh, particularly in contrast to the previous administration, positive attitudes to international institutions. Come on, we all know, particularly this audience, the UN is a morally bankrupt institution. Why pay attention to it? It's of course anti-Israeli institution, by its mere composition. We've seen uh, uh, America removing sanctions against the ICC. America is not part of the ICC. It understands that its interests are not served by being part of it. So why uh, give it some legitimacy? And of course, they are after Israel. They are, they'll be careful. You know, of course, going after America. America is big and strong. So uh, Israel, it's maybe an easier target. Also, this emphasis uh, on human rights. And, you know, I obviously, uh, I, can, I can live only in a democracy. I appreciate, you know, human rights and democratic virtues. But uh, not all the world is like that. Let's face it. And sometimes the choice in foreign countries is between stability and human rights. We've seen it in Egypt. You want uh, the Islamists to go back? By the way, in every election, well, a free election, the Islamists take over. This happened in, uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia. Uh, it happened in, 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 the, in the Palestinian territories. I think now <laughs> even Washington feels relieved that the Palestinians are not going to an election because they know the results. So why should you go after Mubarak? Mubarak is a good era. You're basically pushing into uh, Russian hands. Makes no sense. Why go after Saudi Arabia on, on the issue of human rights? If you uh, will allow full democracy, do you know what will happen? You prefer a stable Saudi Arabia or a Saudi Arabia in political crisis? And at the same time, we don't hear any criticism on the issue of human rights on Iran. Iran is... Uh, the example of democracy in the world, you go make an agreement with the authoritarian, terrible regime. And at the same time, you criticize Saudi Arabia and Egypt. I must say, I don't understand. It's, I don't think it's just hypocrisy. It's more than that. Um, the French foreign minister uh, during Napoleon times and afterwards as well. He said, the worst thing is stupidity. This is plain stupidity. Why not go after Iran? Weaken their hand in the negotiation. You want to make an agreement with them? Make their life difficult. Um, 
there is also a marginal issue. Uh, in my view, this is a Palestinian issue. I don't think that the, this administration will invest much time on the Palestinian issue. And uh, the Palestinians are one of the most anti-American actors in the Middle East. People forget that. In terms of make a poll, take a poll in, in, in the Palestinian territories. You'll see worse anti-American attitudes than other countries in the Middle East. And America is not very much loved in the Middle East with the exception of Israel. So the PA is anti-American, Hamas ruled Gaza is obviously anti-American, and this uh, administration plans to reopen the uh, diplomatic mission of the PA in Washington with, and getting nothing in exchange, you know. You give it for free. That's totally un, un Middle Eastern. Come on, you, you want something? Give me something. No. They are generous to the Palestinians. They also uh, want to renew the economic support to the PA, to UNRWA of all places, an institution that perpetuates the conflict. Uh, we are talking about 235 uh, millions of dollars of your tax money. You are paying for it. You are popping up anti-American regime. It makes no sense. By the way, we may see tensions also in other areas. For example, on Russia. <laughs> your president, uh, we all know what your president called Putin. I'm not sure this was the most uh, diplomatic achievement, the greatest diplomatic achievement of your administration. Um, and uh, you shouldn't forget, uh, we are coordinating our uh, uh, activities in Syria closely with the Russians. This coordination is an Israeli national interest. And we have a very good relationship between our current prime minister, I don't know how long he will be prime minister, and Putin. And Putin is... Uh, respecting uh, Israel uh, strengths and might. And believe me, Putin is not interested in human rights. Is, uh, Putin is interested in uh, actors that uh, has military power and can do damage to Russian interests. And the language uh, the two countries uh, are speaking is not a liberal language. It's real politics. And we understand very well each other. By the way, everybody in the Middle East talks real politics, not human rights. Also on Ukraine, we refrained from uh, a vote at the UN on the issue of Ukraine. We are lucky to have our foreign ministry on strike at that time. And in Israel, we do understand the Russian interest in Ukraine. It's too close to Russia. Don't allow NATO to get into Ukraine. This is the 11th round, the, the area of very important to Russia. And they are afraid. After all, after the end of the Cold War, they saw that the West is going uh, all the way to the East, next to their borders. And this is a buffer zone for them in terms of security. We have to understand their interests. Don't push the Ukrainian issue. And we understand the Russian position. Also on China, and here I think we may bear some of the responsibility. We have a too nonchalant view of the American concerns, even if they are not justified. The Americans talk about uh, Chinese presence at, uh, at the Haifa port. What about Chinese presence at American ports? But we understand, you know, what Jupiter can do, the bull cannot do. So we accept, we are a small country, we understand your concerns. I think we should be more sensitive. 
to, to those concerns. By the way, the Chinese are mis misbehaving also in Israel. I'm not sure you are aware that they try to steal military technology from Israel through the private sector. So uh, I think we should be more careful in our relations with the Chinese. Despite the fact that not all American concerns are really justified. What Israel should do? Um, first of all, we should try to limit the disagreements with Americans as much as possible. We have no interest in a crisis in US-Israeli relations. At the same time, we should emphasize Israel's freedom of action, Israel's right to defend itself. This is something that the Americans have agreed in principle. Of course, there is a difference between agreeing in principle and in practice, but we should stress it as much as possible. We should also work in DC uh, with our Sunni friends, the Abraham Accords partners, uh, to strengthen those accords and prevent bandwagoning on part of UAE and Saudi Arabia. If they see that America deserves it and Israel's hands are tied by America, they may decide to get closer to Iran in order to lessen the threat upon themselves. By the way, we see already signs of it. Uh, there are discussions in Iraq, sponsored by Iraq, between Saudis and Iranians. Um, I'm not sure about exactly you know, what they're meaning. We'll have to wait and see. But this is a source of concern. So we have to act fast, by the way. Um, I think we should also uh, work with our friends in the United States, uh, the Jewish community. We need you to be our voice. And I know that part of the Jewish community is uh, unwilling, unable to be our voice. And it's a pity, but this is reality. So an organization like EMET is very important in order to allow this voice to be heard. Moreover, um, we have a friend in Congress. It, the, the situation is not lost. Of course, evangelicals, and public opinion. Two thirds, at least, of Americans favor Israel. And there is much sympathy in the US for the Israeli position on, on Iran. And basically what we have to prepare everybody is for Israeli unilateral action, because this is what we may have to do in order to uh, meet the Iranian challenge. On this happy note, I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Um, I, first of all, what you just did was um, give us a pep talk because um, Benjamin Well, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, and I every single day feel that it is our responsibility. And I, I don't know if you know Hussein, but I'll introduce him to you at one point, um, to be able to communicate and articulate, articulate as, as best as we possibly can why it is that if the Israelis feel it is appropriate to take certain actions, not saying that they did this in Natanz, but such as Natanz, um, why they feel it is necessary and to evoke a little bit of empathy you know, if, if America were in the strategic position, you know, if Canada or Mexico were working on a nuclear bomb, how would how would we feel in the United States? Um, I wish we had neighbors like Canada. Right, right. 
Kate Elu. Um, so we actually, my first question is, um, of course, we have been reading reports, um, such as the ones you mentioned, of um, Saudi Arabia going to Baghdad and meeting with um, Iranian interlocutors. Um, how do you feel if the Biden administration continues down this track how do you feel this will affect the Abraham Accords and the new, newly formed alliances and friendships that we have with some of our Gulf Arab neighbors? Much depends on Israel. If uh, Israel acts in a re resolute way, the Accords will, uh, will continue. Mm -hmm. They have a clear interest, but you know, economic interests and other interests, but the main reason the UAE, Bahrain, and others are, uh, you know, in favor of uh, having uh, a peace treaty with uh, Israel is because they understand America is no longer there and they need Israel to uh, do the dirty job for it. They can't do it. And only Israel in the region is able to uh, obstruct, delay the Iranian nuclear program. And uh, this has to be clear. If we don't, if we are not strong and act uh, in a strategic way, they leave us. Who needs, uh, you know, the a Jewish state, you know, they are not, uh, you know, Zionists. Uh, okay, we are ready to swallow a Jewish state if it's, of, if it's important in our uh, struggle uh, to deal with Iran. It's quite clear. They are not uh, interested in uh, Israel, a democracy, human rights in Israel. That's nonsense. That's, that doesn't mean anything for those countries. They want a strong ally. One strong ally is leaving America. This is why they need more Israel. All right. Um, I know that in the 1950s, Egypt had been working on a nuclear bomb. Do you feel um, now that um, it looks like the Iranians are making such progress and they're enriching at the 60% level um, that it's going to um, create more of an incentive for some of the Sunni Arab nations to develop their own nuclear capabilities? Once the Biden administration signs a new JCPOA, the immediate result, of course, will be an easier way for the Iranians to the bomb and uh, Countries like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt will uh, do their best not to stay behind. That's obvious. Only uh, Israeli action uh, that uh, delays the fruition of the Iranian nuclear program can prevent nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. And the Biden administration should understand that return to the JCPO equals nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. All right, on that um, sanguine note, I am going to turn um, the podium over to our wonderful director of our program for Israel's national security, Benjamin Whale, who will read some of the questions that have come in. Benji. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mbar, for, um, for everything um, you have just uh, spoken about. And we've gotten dozens of questions uh, come in. Mm -hmm. Um, pr mostly uh, around the Iran issue, which is not the only issue that stands between Israel and the U.S. currently, but definitely is a significant one. Uh, and the first question is, is how would an Israeli airstrike against Iran impact the developing Abraham Accords or other peace treaties in progress? Well, I augment it. Everybody will be happy. It's, you know, I, I think that uh, everybody will come, I know, there is nothing like victory. 
And, and do you think that uh, if Israel were to attack Iran, that they would come to the defense of Israel um, if there's a counter strike? Fortunately, we uh, we don't need uh, uh, you know uh, help from uh, our Arab neighbors. Our uh, doctrine is self-reliance, and we can manage uh, alone, uh, at least for a while. And uh, we've been through missile attacks before, and now we have a three, four tier. Uh, uh, anti-missile defense, uh, which uh, seems to work well. Uh, not a hundred percent proof, but uh, it's working. We had uh, a demonstration last week of a missile coming in without being intercepted. So I, I think that uh, somebody is doing some some additional homework uh, in Israel. And then on that note, does Israel have the military capacity? to stop the Iranian nuclear project? And would Israel need a green light from the United States to do so? Most of all, we don't need a green light. Uh, we don't uh, need even an amber light. It's an Israeli decision. And uh, of course, if the strike is successful, everything is okay. If it's not, uh, we are somewhat in trouble. If we can do it, yes. I think I will refer everybody to an interview with General Kalman, who is now in Washington. He is in charge of uh, the Iranian front, basically. And he was uh, point blank asked, can Israel do it? And he answered uh, in a very Israeli blunt way, yes, we can do it. And uh, I think he doesn't boast. He's a serious guy. And uh, we know that the chief of staff, Kochavi, when he uh, became, took this position, he ordered to refresh the plans for uh, attacking the Iranian nuclear uh, project. And um, it's, it's not an easy job. We should not, uh, you know, uh, Things that uh, it's a piece of cake. It's not uh, what happened in Iraq or in Syria, but uh, I believe uh, I believe uh, General Kalman. But when um, now President uh, Biden served as Vice President in the Obama administration, the administration threatened to shoot down Israeli planes if they attacked Iran. Couldn't this happen again now that Biden is president and? How can Israel truly act on its own without any interference? I think we know most of the American systems. Uh, those systems are uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in friendly countries, and uh, we can arrange uh, with them, you know, uh, electric stoppages, you know, things like that. I don't want to, you know, to be. <laughs> too explicit, but you know, we can manage, you know. Yeah, and speaking of Saudi Arabia, in recent weeks, it seems that while Israel is taking a more uh, militant approach against Iran, Saudi Arabia is trying to get closer to Iran. So what has caused the Saudis not to adopt an approach similar to Israel's? And do the Saudis really believe they will become closer with Iran to the point that the Iranian nuclear uh, program won't be a threat? They are uh, acting uh, as a response to the Iranian threat. And as long as they don't have a nuclear cap capability, uh, they will get to get closer in order not to uh, anger too much uh, Iran. And they will do many things that the Iranians will demand of them in the area of uh, uh, energy, for example. Um, they had uh, disputes in OPEC. So, uh, uh, the Iranians are preparing for a worst case analysis scenario in which America is leaving, Israel is not doing anything and they are left alone vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. So this is a strategic rationale. In my view, at least for the recent discussions we've seen between 
uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Baghdad. And, and with the uh, current leaks uh, that were reported the other day by uh, Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, um, the, the question is, is um, who does that ultimately serve? What was the game plan here? And what are your thoughts on that entire uh, episode? Obviously, uh, Zarif didn't feel comfortable with the leak. He apologized today. Um, first of all, it shows that there is a, a struggle within the Iranian leadership and with the hardliners having the upper hand. They simply ignored uh, Zarif and the whole, uh, you know, moderate, so-called moderate. Um, I think it's not the first time that uh, there are leaks in Washington about uh, Israeli activities or intelligence information. Um, we've seen it before, uh, even with the Trump administration. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, there might be a mistake. Uh, sometimes it's intentional, we don't know. Uh, we obviously don't tell everything to the Americans. Uh, there are areas which, uh, you know, uh, we keep to ourselves, as they do, of course. And, uh, but this is part of, uh, you know, the strategic operation with America. They, we tell them things and they tell us, and there is always a danger of, uh, of some leaks. But uh, you cannot, you know, uh, not cooperate with Americans if you want a real strategic relationship. And do you believe that some of that intelligence uh, sharing between Israel and the United States um, has um, decreased since a number of key uh, positions uh, here in DC are filled by not so sympathetic uh, people towards Israel? <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, I asked my colleagues the same question. Uh, Yaakov Amidro was a national security advisor. And his answer was, listen, we will not uh, limit our cooperation because of a new uh, administration. We'll continue to cooperate and see if, uh, how it goes. Uh, if we'll see uh, that some of the things we are telling the Americans are leaking in a you know, negative way for us, uh, we'll be more careful, but we don't want basically to to limit our cooperation with Americans. So we want to have a healthy relationship with uh, the American defense and intelligence establishment. And um, earlier you spoke about how the uh, new administration here in the United States uh, impacts um, the Arab countries in the Middle East. But then the question is, is how are the Arab Sunni countries in the Middle East responding to this American policy change uh, and what, what, how do you see that involving? They see things exactly like us. <laughs> we have the same messages, exactly the same messages. They are very concerned. They are very concerned. You know, uh, uh, don't for, in Egypt, for example, Mubarak was ousted after uh, Obama decided to, uh, not to care about him. Mubarak probably uh, has similar fears. Uh, the Saudis, you know, uh, they are very concerned about this human rights campaign. So uh, they have uh, the same page with the same messages. And, and in relation to Israel and the policy change here in the United States, how has that impacted some of the uh, Arab countries in the Middle East, their relationship with Israel. Take Turkey, for instance, that uh, it was just reported that they invited my former boss, Yuval Steinitz, Minister of Energy for the first time in God knows how many years, or how do um, other nat natural allies of the United States in the Middle East that usually lean on us for national security, how, how are their national security concerns shifted or more reliant uh, on uh, Israel? There's a difference between Turkey and the Sunni Arabs. The Sunni Arabs uh, are very happy to have good relations. Uh, we see uh, more interactions uh, even in the military arena, military technology, 
Uh, we just heard a big, uh, you know, uh, energy deal, which is uh, significant and very important uh, between UAE and, and Israel. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, I don't see a negative impact on uh, uh, Israeli uh, UAE relationship, or maybe we'll see some more caution on part of the Saudis. But basically, Morocco, Sudan continue uh, at their preferred pace with Israel. Um, uh, of course, uh, being concerned about what's happening in Washington. Turkey is a different story. Turkey uh, is uh, somewhat isolated in the region. Uh, uh, its ambitions are very high. And uh, it understands that Israel plays an important role in containing those ambitions uh, via its uh, relations with uh, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, uh, and uh, the creation of this uh, energy forum uh, that basically is an anti-Turkish you know, uh, partnership. And they want uh, to try to get some more uh, freedom of action in, in this area. Uh, they tried with Libya to have a maritime you know, uh, agreement, agreement on the exclusive economic zone, which was not welcomed any, by Israel, by Greece, by Egypt, and by Cyprus. Uh, and now they try to court uh, Israel. Uh, frankly, in terms of energy export, the cheapest way to export is by a turkey. To go with, with a, you know, a pipeline to, to Cyprus and from there 100 kilometers to Turkey. And Turkey has uh, the infrastructure to bring the energy to Europe. Um, and we decided uh, not to do it because we don't want to have Turkey's uh, hand on our energy tap export. We don't want to be dependent because of uh, the political atmosphere in Turkey. And they try to change it because they understand that in order to strengthen their uh, role as an energy breed between you know, the energy coming from the East, from Azerbaijan, from the Gulf, from Iraq, to Europe, uh, they need also the, the gas in, in the Mediterranean. So they play games. They, uh, try uh, sometimes to lower the rhetoric against Israel, but Erdogan didn't change, basically. He remains anti-Israeli, uh, he remains anti-Semitic. Uh, this is what I'm less concerned about. Uh, you know, some of the anti-Semites are good friends of Israel. Uh, they make a distinction. But uh, I don't see any blooming relations with Turkey. Thank you. Um, and, and another question. I wouldn't uh, advise Steinitz to go to Turkey now because of COVID, but uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> He's fully vaccinated. <laughs> Still. <laughs> there are mutations. <laughs> the last thing we need is a Turkish mutation now, uh, yeah. too. Um, if Israel is on a collision course with uh, the Biden administration, and I think the key word here is if, uh, are there alternatives to minimize its potential negative consequences? And does Israel have alternatives to avoid that collision or minimize the negative consequences? Yes, and at the end, we are an independent country and we have to make a decision uh, to anger uh, the Biden administration uh, and eventually they'll grow up uh, or they will get over it or uh, to face an existential threat from uh, uh, from Iran. Uh, my advice to the government is uh, to risk uh, a, a difficult uh, period with Americans uh, and uh, to put an end to the existential threat. But this is uh, not my decision. This is, you know, we have to calculate what's, uh, what's best for our country. Would any of that uh, risk management involve tilting Israel's not political, but military uh, aspect towards Russia and China to balance um, the collision with how they, how, how the United States and Israel see the Iranian nuclear project? 
There is no substitute for America. Let's face it. China, Russia is not America. America is a democratic country. We share the same values, we share the same, same interests. China and Russia is different. Also, they are, uh, don't have the same political power, military power, economic power like the United States. And we also shouldn't forget uh, there is a Jewish community in America, a big Jewish community in America that we also have to take into consideration in our calculations. We want, uh, you know, to have, uh, we have a duty, an obligation to have good relations uh, with uh, Jewish communities abroad. And then uh, shifting away a little from the Iranian realm into another realm of the Israel-US relationship, uh, how is it that President Biden has appointed so many Jews to important positions and yet is suspected by many pro-Israelites uh, of intending to reverse much of Trump's position actions towards Israel. Do you think it is helpful that there are many Jews working in the Biden administration for the benefit of Israel? <laughs> Not every Jew is smart enough to be pro-Israeli. You know, <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, uh, American Jewry, uh, uh, is, you know, I don't want to be harsh, you know, uh, they are my brothers, but uh, they are mistaken. Many are mistaken uh, in their uh, view of Israel. Uh, and um, uh, being Jewish does not uh, always uh, make you a friend of Israel, even if you say so. J Street is saying they are friends of Israel. I don't need such friends. <laughs> And I think we have uh, time for one last question. Um, what are your views of the uh, reported uh, uh, amb new ambassador of the United States uh, to Israel? I don't know the person. Um, uh, I hope he's not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that we will treat him well. <laughs> We'll try to uh, make him feel at home. We are a very, uh, you know, pro-American country. And uh, I'm sure uh, he'll get the respect he deserves, uh, you know, uh, by being the ambassador, uh, you know, the envoy of, of the United States, which basically is an Israel's friend. So, uh, um, uh, you know, I... The former ambassador Shapiro, we were friends, and he, he's Jewish, you know. And uh, I always said, you know, you 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 have a very difficult position, you know, here to explain Obama. And uh, uh, but we liked him. He's a, he's a likable person, but uh, we didn't like Obama. So I don't think he was a very successful ambassador, you know, in in trying in convincing Israelis that they should. Uh, accept uh, Obama's views. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, this will be the destiny of the new ambassador as well. Okay, um, Afrayan, I think our time is coming to a close here. I wanna um, close with one very small vignette. Um, and that is that um, as, as I might've told you, I used to be very close personal friends with Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick. And she said the worst day of her life was when she was called by her president, Ronald Reagan, um, to go to the United Nations General Assembly. Um, it was the morning after the news got out that Israel had struck the nuclear reactor in Osirak, Iraq. And Jean Kirkpatrick was an amazing friend of Israel. And the president had said in no uncertain terms, you are to condemn Israel for what they have just done. And she said, Sarah, I knew in the pit of my stomach that there will be one day where we will thank Israel for taking that bold move. And I'm afraid Israel might be again forced to take these bold moves and the United States might not like it, but um, I think eventually they will find themselves in a position to thank Israel. 
So Ephraim, I can't thank you enough for your years and years of friendship and wisdom. And um, I, I would love everybody to look at the website of the Jerusalem Institute of Security um, and Strategy. Okay. Strategy and Security and right, JISS.org. And um, please support that organization. Also, all of this costs us a great deal of money and time, but we really believe that a well informed public does um, trickle up to our policymakers. Um, and um, we do this as a public service. So if anybody would like to support Amet, we could certainly use anyone's support. Um, please tune in next week. We're having a brilliant expert, Chris Witt, who is the head of Signal. Signal is a think tank in Jerusalem that is devoted to the Israeli-Chinese relationship. And the reason I have asked Paris to speak is because we are very concerned about the $200 billion deal between China and Iran. Um, and she is going to be addressing that. Um, so that will be next Wednesday at 12 p.m. And um, thank you to all of our viewers. Um, and we've, we've had a wonderful audience today. And, um, and thanks mostly to Professor Fryam Inver. Thank you. My pleasure. All the best for, from Jerusalem. Thank you. <laughs> okay.